Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, it's nice to, nice to see you. I appreciate being invited. And um, Joe talks about my professional interest in student loans and financial aid. And I have been doing this for quite a while. But I first became interested by borrowing a whole lot of money, um, like many of you, to get my education. My sister and I are first generation college educated, so it was loans or nothing for me. And, and I got all the stuff the poor kids get, Pell Grants, Perkins loans, all of it. And I still owed 125,000 when I graduated from Duke. Um, so I've been making payments on my loans for about 15 years, and I've got about 15 years left to go. Uh, when I first graduated, I was paying $1,500 a month because our interest rates back then were closer to 8.5%. Um, but my loans were variable, so they got cheaper for a while, which is great, um, but didn't, isn't going to happen for you, unfortunately. Um, but what I'm, what I'm thrilled to be able to tell you about is that there is some real relief for people who have student loans, and especially those who are interested in careers in public service, in the government or in nonprofits. Uh, it can be hard to do that, but it's much easier now than it used to be. Um, the problem with some of the programs is that they are overly complicated. They're um, really convoluted and have all these ridiculous little rules and things that, and hoops that you have to jump through. So one of the things I want to do is sort of break that down so that you don't fall into any of the sort of um, traps or pitfalls that um, are possible. So that was what I was thinking. Um, and I also thought maybe we could start with just a brief exercise, if you don't mind. I was going to ask if you could stand up for just a moment. So I want you to think about your, your college debt or the debt of the loved one whose behalf you're here, right? So I want you to think about that total number. And if you're in school still and you're still working on your education, think about how much you'll owe when you graduate. Um, so, and if you've graduated, think about how much you owe now, which unfortunately for a lot of recent graduates is more probably than what you owed when you graduated, right, with the accrual of the interest. So for me it was 125000 um, And if you borrowed less than 10000 sit down. 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100000 All right, I would say that's probably half, maybe a slight majority. Um, 110? 120, 130, that's where I would sit down, 140, 150, 160, 170, 180. Oh yeah, you guys are, we got four, we got four, five really, really smart people still standing. Anybody want to keep going? 190, 200, 300? Okay, whew, you guys are the winners, awesome. Any, do you guys have more than the JDs and the, and the bachelors, PhDs, anyone? Other masters, or it's just really a BA and a JD. Yeah, so anyway, so education's expensive, right? So, and as we say in the South, um, I'm not from the South, but I live there, um, we all have a dog in this fight, as we say in the South. Um, so, uh, so some of you are also interested in public service positions. How many of you here are currently working for the government? You are. <laughs> or for a nonprofit of some sort? Many of you, okay, great. Great, awesome. Well, um, I, have some, I have some good information for you. We're going to talk about public service. I thought I'd start by giving you kind of an overview so we can be using uh, the same terminology. We'll talk about which jobs qualify um, specifically. Um, and I want to just give you, in general, some ideas for how you can minimize the cost of the borrowing you've done. Um, the problem is when you buy things on credit, even when it's your education, uh, you pay something for having borrowed that money. And, and sometimes you pay a lot, depending on how you repay the loan. Um, and so we'll talk about that. Um, we'll talk about some really um, boring stuff about which loans are which, because there are many different kinds. Uh, and your options depend a lot on which kind of loans you have. Um, and then we'll think some about consolidation. I get a lot of questions about student loan consolidation, because it's confusing, and there are good reasons to do it, and there are some reasons not to do it. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. Um, and um, I'll take whatever questions you have. Um, and then we'll discuss some of the repayment options that are available and some of the other loan repayment assistance programs in addition to public service loan forgiveness. Um, and then if there's anything else that you want me to address, just holler. Uh, this will be way more fun if, you, if we interact as we go rather than me just standing up here uh, blabbering on, which is pretty fun just in itself, I mean, you know. Um, all right, so... You have some different options when you've got student loans. The main you know, sort of plan is 
just pay the stuff off really quickly and then you'll minimize your costs. And that's great if you're in a you know, big job making big money um, or you have a trust fund, that works out really well. That, that's one way to go about it. There are other things that you can do. Um, you can pay the debt more slowly. Um, you want to recognize, though, that in that case, there will be a, a larger um, interest bill that accrues over time. And so um, if you have some eligibility for forgiveness, you want to maximize your ability to benefit from these programs. And there are some tax consequences that you're going to have to keep in mind. Um, I'll tell you what those are. Um, and, and if you're like many of us in this room and you're inclined to do public service work, um, that can actually be a, a fabulous and smart way to minimize the cost of your debt. Um, it, it, in fact, really is true that for some people, doing a career in public service is, um, is a much smarter financial decision than it once was, even though the salaries are not what they, what they are in the private sector um, because of the student loan benefits that are available. Um, and in any case, you need to be sort of checking and double-checking your strategy as you go along because whatever decisions you make now are based on what you know now, and things might change. Uh, things will change uh, over time. So, all right. So public service loan forgiveness. Who has heard that it takes 10 years to earn public service loan forgiveness? You have, right? Yeah, and that is true. It does take 10 years to earn public service loan forgiveness. At least. But really, the way that you earn public service loan forgiveness is by making payments on your loans. That's how it's measured. That's what triggers the forgiveness, is that you've made 120 qualifying payments, and that's uh, a payment per month for 10 years. Um, but it could take longer than 10 years for you to make 120 qualifying payments. Uh, but I encourage you to think about it in terms of the number of qualifying payments you've made because that is uh, what will keep you focused on the, the details you need to uh, be aware of in order to actually get to the finish line. Um, let me show you an example so you can see how, um, how generous this program can be in some cases. And that might not be very easy for you to read, is it? Not at all. It's quite small, isn't it? I always sort of had in mind this like enormous screen, you know, like at the uh, rock concerts, whatever. I recently saw Maroon 5 in um, Raleigh. It was a pretty good show. Um, OK, so I'll just tell you how fabulous this is. It's people in public service who, who are um, borrowing and repaying loans over a period of time could, in a sort of a typical law grad situation, stand to have more than 130 grand canceled after 10 years of public service. This is an example of somebody who, who started out owing 100,000 in student loans which of course for some of you is lower than what you actually owe, for others of you it's higher. Um, but I'll, I'll make these examples available to you online too. Joe will post them with the recording and stuff so you can look at them, because the numbers I think are pretty in, instructive. Um, and you might see something that reminds you of yourself. Um, there's a, there's a um, forgiveness program that's not associated with public service that we're gonna talk about today as well. Um, there's these income-driven plans that are a big part of student loan repayment these days. And those income-driven repayment plans have their own forgiveness provisions that are not tied to your employment. So this is for people who, for whatever reason, do not do public service or do not complete all the requirements of the program. Um, if you get some loans canceled through that longer-term method, I want you to be aware up front that that forgiveness is taxable as income to you. Uh, it's still good to get forgiveness, but it's less good than it would otherwise be because there would be a tax bill due on that forgiveness. But public service loan forgiveness is not taxable as income, which is, a, which is very different. So um, that's quite encouraging. When the legislation was first passed, we weren't entirely sure what the um, IRS was going to do with this or how it would be interpreted. Um, but we have had uh, clarification from them that, yes, indeed, it is not taxable income to the borrowers. So tax-free forgiveness, um, awesomely beneficial to you. So I like to talk about public service loan forgiveness in five steps. I used to call, I used to call it five easy steps, um, but then I realized that that was, you know, not true, and, and I didn't want to annoy people by like, oh, five easy steps. They'd be like, what is easy about that? 
Um, but really five steps. So, so to get public service loan forgiveness, you have to make the right kind of payments. You have to make the right kind of payments on the right kind of loans uh, while you're working in the right kind of job. Uh, so that's where the public service comes in. That's only one part of it. Uh, and you have to make these payments over and over again. You've got to have 120 of them to get the cancellation. Um, and finally, but, but not least of all, you have to do a whole bunch of paperwork um, and you have to do it right to the satisfaction of the federal government. Federal government's pretty picky about stuff, right? Am I right? Picky about stuff. So um, that's one of, the, one of the steps we'll discuss. Um, but the, the sort of um, best part of public service loan forgiveness is that the jobs that qualify are really, really broad. Um, it's all full-time paid work for the government or for a 501c3 nonprofit organization, um, and also for some other positions as well. So it doesn't have to be a lawyer job. It can be any kind of, of position for the government. So you could be doing, uh, you could be teaching, you could be practicing law, you could be doing you know, AV work, you could be doing whatever. If you were full-time and you worked for the government, that would be a public service job. It doesn't have to be in your degree field, none of that. Um, but it does have to be full-time, and we'll talk about exactly what that means, and it does have to be for money. So volunteer work uh, is great, but if just, just because you're showing up you know, at the DA's office every day doesn't mean you're employed by them. Right? You have to actually have that relationship. That make sense? Yeah, exactly, it is. So her question was, was, is it any form of government or any branch of government? And the definition is that it is state, local, federal, tribal. It's all of the um, government entities, the government agencies. Um, it is not the international government. Uh, it is not the, it is not foreign governments or those or those, what do they call those tribunals like the Inter-American Council on such and such? So, yes, so quasi-governmental organizations or organizations that are made up of government officials from various jurisdictions do not count. Um, although the people who do work in those kinds of things may have another way of qualifying. Um, the only government jobs that are specifically excluded, and I'll get your question in just one second, um, elected members of the United States Congress are excluded. Um, and what I think is even funnier about that is that it wasn't Congress that excluded themselves, it was the, it was the administrative branch, it was the Department of Education that, that wrote that into the regs. They're like, no Congress people are gonna be getting any of this forgiveness. So, can't be an elected member of Congress. Um, and government contractors do not qualify. Was that gonna be your question or no? Okay, tell me your question. My question is the whole thing about you don't have to necessarily be an attorney. Is that applicable to 501c3s also? Yes, it is. Uh, so his question is the whole thing about whether you got to be a lawyer or not, does that apply to the, to the nonprofit positions as well? It does. Um, this program has nothing to do with lawyers. This is a federal program for student loan borrowers who work for the government or nonprofits. Um, of course, we know that as lawyers, we have expensive educations that we borrow a lot of money to pay for. Um, but there are lots of other people who have student loans as well. So it, it's gonna benefit you know, teachers, librarians, um, uh, lots of folks like that. Yes? How, how did I know you were gonna ask the military question? Can you see his haircut? It, he's definitely, you know, right? My husband just retired from the Marine Corps, so I can make fun, I can make fun of the military. You're like, yes ma'am, yes you can. No, he's not even laughing, he's still not laughing. These are the jokes, they're not going to get any better. Well, maybe they will. Um, yes, the military qualifies, absolutely. That's a job for the federal government. So unless you're doing um, work in the reserves where you're really not full-time employed. So, but if you were activated, and that, then that would be full-time during the period in which you were activated. Um, so, but yes, I mean, civilian employees and active duty uh, staff are gonna be absolutely government employees. So same for judicial clerks, um, yes. Yeah, 
Uh, so her question is whether, whether it's consecutive 10 years or not, or whether she can go in and out of public service jobs. Um, right, so that it does not have to be consecutive. Um, you, you have to reach 120 payments, but they don't have to be 120 payments in a row. So you could do some time in public service and then switch and do some stuff in the private sector or switch and have some time when you were you know, staying home with children or anything else and go back and start, off, uh, start where you left off. You don't lose any of that credit or anything. So uh, theoretically, it could take you 20 years to make 120 qualifying payments. But there are some real limitations on how long it can take only because you still have to make payments on your loans even if you're not in public service in most circumstances. So you, you'd get to the point where eventually you'd pay them off yourself before you got to the forgiveness mark. But no, they don't have to be consecutive. So, awesome. Okay, so um, we talked already a little bit about the definition of government being broad. Um, I do also want to point out a 501c3 nonprofit is a certain kind of nonprofit. There, there are a lot of them. That is like civil legal aid organizations, advocacy organizations, lots of stuff are C3s, but there are other kinds of nonprofits like C4s and C6s that are things like membership organizations or political organizations. Those don't automatically qualify the way a 501c3 does, but they might still qualify, work for them might still qualify, but it's gonna be a more gray area and it will depend on what you do. So if you work for the government or you work for the 501c3, then no one cares what you do as long as you're employed full time and you're getting paid, right? You can be having any position um, with the exception of, of um, being a, uh, a preacher of some sort, a religious uh, figure. Um, but, you, but if you're working for some other kind of nonprofit, it might still qualify if it meets this definition of a public service organization. And this is where actually some of those international things might fit in and some other things, um, some membership organizations. So if you have a funky job like that or you're contemplating one, um, you should certainly look more closely at the, um, at the details. But it's, an, it's a very narrow sort of category. Um, and most things fit pretty neatly into, into the larger categories. Um, okay. So um, I did want to make sure I made clear that if you're working on contract for the government, that doesn't make you a government employee. Um, and it also doesn't enable you to qualify for public service loan forgiveness. Like, for example, a lot of lawyers do court-appointed work. So, you know, I did a criminal defense for a long time, and I did it in North Carolina. I got paid by the state of North Carolina. I represented poor people. Just looks like a public defender, walks like a public defender, but was not a public defender. Um, now, for a while, I did that at a nonprofit law firm, um, and so I could have qualified if this program existed um, by virtue of working for the nonprofit, but not during the period of time when I was working um, as a self-employed um, sole proprietor. So, cool. Um, all right, and the full-time requirement gets a little tricky too. So. Um, the first question to ask yourself is whether your employer has a definition of what counts as full time. So a lot of jobs will say you have to work 40 hours a week to be considered full time or 35 point whatever hours a week. Um, if your employer has a definition like that, then you must meet your employer's definition of what counts as full time. You can work part time if you want, but the payments you make won't count towards forgiveness while you're working part time. Okay, um, but if your employer has no such standard, or if your employer's standard is lower than 30 hours a week, then you look to the standard in the student loan law, which says 30 hours per week counts as full time. That's not an issue for most public interest lawyers, right? They're working plenty of hours. Yes, Joe. You can, so his question is whether you can do two part-time jobs. What'd you say? Uh-huh. So he wants to know if two part-time jobs would be eligible, yes. So you can piece together more than one job and, and get yourself into full-time public service. You can, you can do as many different gigs as you want, in which case you would look at the 30-hour-a-week standard, even if the employers had different standards. 
um, you look right back at the 30 hours a week. So, so, and that's actually, you know, a very, um, uh, could potentially be a very good strategy for some of you. Because uh, there are often nonprofits that don't have the money to hire somebody full time, but might be able to take someone on part time and maybe could do it at more than one place. So, that would be good. Okay. So, any other questions about what employment qualifies? Yeah. So his question is whether getting a job at your degree granting institution is um, ineligible for public service loan forgiveness. There is no such rule, um, but but I can think of case a, a number of cases where that might end up being the being the situation. So what can happen is, for example, um, law schools sometimes are having these like fellowship programs or continuation programs where they're. Um, placing graduates into nonprofit positions but paying their salaries. The question you always need to ask is um, who is your employer? You know, for whom do you work? Um, and it's not so much where you work as, as who pays you and who, you know, who writes you that, those official documents. Um, but there's nothing that excludes you from being employed by your alma mater. And, and the majority of schools are organized as 501c3s, uh, whether they're public or private institutions. Um, there are some that are organized for profit, in which case it wouldn't qualify as a public service job, but not because it was your, your school. So I can think of one more job question that you might think of later. Maybe you thought of it, yes. Oh, that's a good question. That wasn't what I was thinking, but that is a good question. So he's wondering about what if I'm working on the Hill for somebody in Congress, I'm not the elected official, that does qualify. So if you're, on, if you're a staffer, that employment qualifies. Um, it's only if you are yourself personally an elected member of the United States Congress. So you can be elected for other positions, state, local positions of any sort, um, or you can be working for elected officials at the federal congressional level, and that qualifies. Um, and in, in reality, congressional staffers have access to a really sweet loan repayment assistance program in addition to this one, which is not well publicized and the details are very difficult to ferret out because they really actually keep it on the down low. Um, and somebody is going to ask me whether this program is going to last, right? So we should talk about that right now when we're talking about Capitol Hill um, because it's an excellent question, right? It, and um, the the legislation was passed by Congress, and it is the law of the land, and it would take an act of Congress to change it. So it can't be just cut out of a budget um, by an administrator, it can't be defunded, it doesn't work that way. It would require an actual act of Congress to undo it. Um, and so I don't actually lose a lot of sleep about that eventuality yet. Um, and I think about these things, you know, a lot. So um, I don't know if you've noticed, Congress doesn't lately get a whole lot passed in general. Um, there's one law in particular they've been especially trying to undo lately, um, the Health Care Act, um, and they haven't been successful in that. So, you know, that's one thing to think about. Another thing to think about, though, is that this really does operate more like an entitlement program. It's not subject to the appropriations process. So it isn't like a lot of government programs in which um, it's all about the money. Uh, this is somewhat different. Um, I do think that once people start earning a lot of forgiveness, which won't start happening for uh, quite, a, quite a number of years from now, that, that we do need to be vigilant about you know, looking at the effectiveness of the program and you know, being willing to engage in the political process. But I um, personally don't see it as a uh, a huge risk right now, but certainly there are no guarantees uh, in life, absolutely. Uh, and Congress can do what Congress wants to do. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll see on that. But the other thing I was going to note is that all the congressional staffers are recent law graduates. So they have a lot of student debt and they get paid nothing. Um, yeah. Uh, 
that's a good question. He wants to know who's losing this money um, because they're, they're a, an asset. I mean, they're loans. They're, somebody was going to collect on those loans. Um, so you're right. There are some student loans that are bought and sold that, as investment instruments that are collateralized and packaged and traded as in, um, for investment. Federal student loans um, are not. And in fact, one of the reasons that public service loan forgiveness was even uh, passable um, was that it isn't uh, the case that the government is, is repaying anyone. It's, it's, it's really true that the Department of Treasury, the United States government, is, is declining to collect on debt owed to it, us, the taxpayers. Um, there isn't any payout to any third party, which is r rather different from a legislative perspective if you have to actually cut a check. Um, so that's how it works. It's really sort of self-funding in a way, too, because there are parts of the law, um, in fact, this same legislation slashed the subsidies that were previously paid to lenders that participated in a, um, a previous federal loan program that used to involve private lending companies. So it's... it's um, it actually is a money maker in that sense, the, the legislation was for the government. Yes? So she's wondering about when she can start counting payments that she made. Um, so she had had a public service job at a university and wants to know, you know, is that going to count too? So. It's a great question, and you do want to look and see, okay, which payments count towards forgiveness and which don't. A um, couple things to think about are that uh, this legislation took effect on October 1st of 2007. So none of the payments any of us made, if you made any, I made a whole lot, before October 1st, 2007, count towards forgiveness. No way, no how. Um, so the first possible date is October 1st, 2007. But you also have to get all the other parts right. So you have to have been in the right repayment plan, and you have to have been making payments on the right loan. And it's unlikely that many of us were doing that in 2007, um, because some of the eligible repayment plans didn't start coming online until later. So you're right to uh, engage in that you know, sort of thought process and take a look through your loans. And once we go through the repayment plans and stuff, you should be able to evaluate whether those payments qualified or not. They could have. Um, it's possible. So, yeah, so I'll take your question and then I'll move through some other stuff and then we'll keep talking. Yeah. So I'm repeating the questions because I was told to do that for the video. Um, he wants to know if he can found his own nonprofit and whether that would qualify as a real public service job. Yes, absolutely. Do it. Yeah, no, there's no prohibition that you not be the founder of your own 501c3. There really, really isn't. Now, of course, doing that is hard. It takes a lot of work. It takes some money. You have to apply for the status, and that's not free. You have to have a board of directors. You have to do all kinds of stuff. You have to have a charitable mission. You have to do fundraising. So it's not like that's a piece of cake. But if you have an idea and, and you're motivated and you, and you accomplish it, yes. Now, what I'm not sure I understand um, although I've tried, um, is whether there's some minimum amount of money that you have to be paying yourself when you're getting started. So that's not addressed by the student loan law, and I'm not an employment law expert. Um, I know there are some rules about labor, and there's some things, like, you know, there's minimum wage, and then there's these sort of exempt and non-exempt, and there's all this kind of other stuff. So um, there may well be some requirement that you be paid a certain amount, but if there is, I don't know what it is. Yay, my iPhone is found, hallelujah. I lost my phone when I first got to campus, yay. Um, so yeah, so no, and, and I actually have thought about that a fair amount for like indigent defense attorneys in particular, because there are lots of people, and also some employment lawyers that are really doing public interest work within the context of private practice. Um, and because of the organization of the practice, it doesn't qualify. But there's no real reason they couldn't establish nonprofit law firms. Nonprofit firms do exist. So, um, all right. So let's talk about what payments you have to make. And you know, you don't want to talk about making payments. That's not as fun as. Um, but so you you need to choose one of these income-driven plans and make payments under an income-driven repayment plan if you want them to count the payments to count towards forgiveness. Um, now, you don't have to be in public service to benefit from an income-driven repayment plan. 
they're more broadly available. Um, and there are a boatload of them, um, and you want to pick the one that's best for you and that you can get. Um, I want you to be very cautious, especially those of you who are already working, um, about these long-term repayment plans. Um, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, so student loans have a standard repayment term of 10 years. A lot of people consolidate and get access to a longer term or length of time over which to pay their loans. What, what we used to do, and the, the best strategy used to be getting a 30-year consolidation term, so spreading our payments out like that. People who have been making payments under those repayment plans are not getting any closer to public service loan forgiveness. Those longer term repayment plans that are available to you will not count towards forgiveness, even if you're making a payment that's higher than what you would have made under an income driven plan. So um, be, be cautious about that, and we'll talk um, in detail about these income driven plans so you can see what the deal is with those. Um, the other way that it's confusing is that they, they call those long-term plans standard. They don't just call the 10-year plan standard. For people who have consolidation loans, so, you know, some loan servicer may say to you, oh, you're in a standard repayment plan, so you think, okay, I'm all right. But no, that's not necessarily true. Um, be very cautious about uh, selecting your repayment option. Okay. So there are a number of advantages to these income-driven plans, um, and there are some disadvantages as well. Uh, one of the cool things is that the payments are affordable based on your income, so that's a good thing. Um, with federal loans, you, you definitely have to be making the payments that are due, so the payments that are due have to be affordable. Um, and these plans help make that possible. They also have an interest subsidy associated with them. Um, that you can benefit from. Some of us have loans that are um, subsidized loans, meaning that the, the government uh, paid the interest for us while we were in school. So you may have some portion of your student loans that are subsidized. Um, if that's the case, then the government pays the interest on that portion for the first three years that you're in one of these income-driven repayment plans. So that's a bonus. The other good thing that happens with interest in these plans is that um, if you don't pay all the interest that's adding up every month, um, it doesn't immediately get added to the principal of the loan. So that's called capitalization. So if, you, if, if interest is adding up, but you're not even paying all the interest that's adding up, um, usually what happens is that gets tacked on to the principal of the loan, which is bad and expensive, right? Because then it starts earning interest itself, what was previously interest, and that gets crazy um, quick. But capitalization um, doesn't, isn't triggered uh, unless certain events occur. So it has that benefit. But it, it also has the corresponding you know, risk, which is that they let you pay less than the interest that's accruing on your loan, which means you're just getting more and more in debt. right? You're not actually getting ahead of your loan. Um, and that may be um, fine if you're, if you're serving, um, you know, doing your public service and completing the provisions and getting your loan forgiveness. Um, and it may be necessary if you need that payment to afford your loans. Um, but it is um, you know, the, the sort of other side of the coin uh, that you want to have your, your eyes open about. Um, so yeah, so those are the capitalization benefits. And then the income-driven options have their own possibility of forgiveness. So what if you're thinking, OK, I don't know if I'm going to do a full 10 years of public service, but right now I'm doing public service. And because I'm doing public service, I'm way underpaid, right? Which is what, that's almost the definition of public service, right? You're doing the kind of stuff that you can't get paid adequately to do because you're, you know, helping the poor or whatever. Um, well, the income-driven options have their own cancellation benefits. Uh, they just take a lot longer to earn. Um, they happen after 20 or 25 years of repayment if you still owe money on your loans, depending on the plan. And you can kind of be working towards both of these kinds of forgiveness at the same time, essentially. You don't have to know what's going to happen um, and whether you're going to get the 10-year public service loan forgiveness or not. If you get it, great. If you don't, then um, this is um, also can kick in uh, towards the end if you still owe money. Um, but if you, if you are earning good, earning good and paying you know, high payments, then you may not 
owe anything and you may take care of it all yourself. No? Um, and the big thing about these income driven plans for purposes of tonight's discussion is that they are the ones that count towards the 120 payments that are required to earn public service loan forgiveness. That's how you make those qualifying payments. Um, so um, I was going to talk about the, um, the loans here for a minute and then give you some more detail about the different income driven plans, unless there's other questions right now. Yeah. Yes, so, uh, so she, she's asking whether, whether if she's paying less than the interest that's accruing and she ultimately earns public service loan forgiveness if the interest is, uh, is forgiven as well as the principal and if, the, if it's both those forgivenesses are tax free. Yes, okay. yep. Yeah, so she's asking about whether there's an income cap and if you can kind of earn your way out of, of getting public service loan forgiveness. And the answer is mm, yes and no, mostly no. So um, the, the answer is no, you can, you can make any salary. There is no income cap um, that disqualifies you from public service loan forgiveness. But, the, but in reality, if you make a lot, you pay a lot because that's how these repayment plans work. Your payments are based on your income. So there is a ratio of your debt to your income where you could, you could have an income so high as compared to your debt that by the time you made the payments that were required for the 10 year period, there wouldn't be anything left to forgive. So it really truly is not a, a cap or any kind of cutoff, but it is just the case that in reality, some people will earn their way out. And in fact, you know, some of the good federal um, lawyer jobs, for example, if you go straight to like the Department of Justice out of law school, they, they pay well and they, have, they get good increases all along. So, and they also have additional loan repayment assistance benefits. So uh, people who owe a kind of a typical amount or a somewhat less than average amount could go into those jobs and not end up needing any forgiveness after 10 years. Um, but you know, if you look at, on the other hand, at the example of someone doing like civil legal aid, um, for 10 years, you know, you, absolutely there'll be money left to cancel at the end. So, okay. Yes, sir. Are there good That's an excellent question and a complicated one to answer. And um, I, I will address that thoroughly. If you don't mind, I'll just postpone it a little bit because um, uh, I wanted to cover a couple other things first to sort of set it up. Um, but I will get there here momentarily. Um, so, but let, me, let me just make sure you guys are clear on which loans are which to begin with too, okay? So we know that you have to make the right kind of payments and that those are income driven payments. And we're gonna talk more about whose income and how that works. Um, but you have to be making those payments on the right kind of loan. Now, as time goes by, you guys are gonna have more of the right kind of loan and less of the wrong kind of loan. But some of us here need to take some extra steps to get those situated. Um, because your, because your options in terms of choosing these repayment plans and getting this forgiveness depends on what type of loans you have. Um, it also depends on the status of your loans and by that I just want to tell you that like if you have loans that are in default, um, you can't be making payments that count towards forgiveness. And um, I'd be happy to give you some more information about that if you want to stick around after the session and talk to me. Um, because if a loan is in default, everything is different. Um, but there are lots of different kinds of student loans and we, and many of us have a whole bunch of different sorts of student loans that you have to think about somewhat differently. Um, so the sort of general categories of loans are the federal loans and the private loans. Those are your sort of two big distinctions. Um, the, the private loans are easy for us to talk about because there, there really isn't any flexibility in what you can do. Uh, to begin with, they're not eligible for public service loan forgiveness at all. Um, many of you hopefully don't have a lot of private loans or any private loans. 
Uh, mostly law students borrow them for that bar study loan right after school. That's a private loan always. Um, but if you went to a really expensive undergraduate school, you might have them for undergrad. Um, if, you're, if you went to school a long time ago, like me, we didn't get as many federal loans, so you might have private loans. Those are just not eligible for anything good ever. Um, uh, that's just the deal with those. Now, the federal loans are totally flexible. There's almost always something you can do about your federal loans. Um, they either, especially these days, there is just no reason why you can't handle your federal loans, no matter what happens to you in your life. Um, but they are excessively complicated, and you have to think a lot about what is the right thing for you to do. Um, but I encourage you to, to pull a copy of your credit report just to double and triple check um, whether you have any private loans or what they are, that's where you would find them. There's no other sort of central database. Um, and also um, recognize that if you do have those loans, how many people here know for sure you have private loans? Not that many of us. See, that did not used to be the case. So um, we should be aware that like, the interest rates might be sort of okay right now because the economy is so bad on those private loans, but they're almost certainly going to go up over time and they may um, have no cap. Uh, so, so those loans are something to you know, really sort of think differently about. Um, this is my little visual aid for how you can remember which, which student loans are which. Private student loans are bad. Um, yes? They are federal loans. They're federal loans. Um, uh, he's asking about the grad plus loans, which is, which is why, you know, for those of you who are working in public service settings, you'll see that the more experienced staff members and attorneys are less likely to benefit from these programs because they um, have a lot more private debt because we didn't have the grad plus loan program until 2006. So it's really people starting in 2006 who were able to borrow enough of the federal loans and, and avoid the private loans uh, enough in order to really be well situated. Um, tell your little nieces and nephews and friends and neighbors to avoid private student loans. Um, but if you do have pro private student loans, it's just like any other contract. So if you're studying law and you know it's all about the contract, it's not all, it's, the federal government doesn't really care, doesn't really get involved, there isn't, there's not a whole bunch of regulation. You just read that promissory note, whatever it says is the deal. Um, but one thing that's good about private loans is they can't really, you know, they can't get you the way the federal government can. Um, the federal government collects on, on federal loans uh, quite uh, actively, whereas private lenders, pff, all they can do is sue you, right? And as we say in the South, you can't get blood from a turnip, whatever that means. Um, so, so to get an inventory of your federal loans, you should visit the National Student Loan Data System. The National Student Loan Data System is where you will see all your federal loans from way back and all the way through. And I, you need to look for very specific information about your loans. Um, and what you wanna do is figure out what kind of federal loans you have, okay? Cause you got a bunch of them. Um, you guys in law school are almost certainly borrowing unsubsidized Stafford loans, cause that's what you do to begin with. And then you're going for those grad plus loans. So you're more likely to have those kinds of loans. If you borrowed in, in past years, recently past years, you probably have an interest rate of 6.8% on your Stafford loans and 7.9% on your Grad Plus loans. Um, some of you may also have federal consolidation loans. Who's got a consolidation loan? Yeah, I got a consolidation loan, right. Um, and um, does anybody here have a Perkins loan? Yeah, those are the poor kid loans, by the way, y'all, yeah. There aren't there are many of them uh, here. Then there are the Parent PLUS loans. If you have children in college, you might be borrowing those for your children in college. Um, you might have parents who borrowed them for you while you were in undergraduate school. Okay, Parent PLUS loans are special. I'm not gonna really address them because I don't think many of you are probably loaded up with those. Um, but they are different and special, so bear in mind that they're not quite the same. Um, but this is, uh, this is really important. Okay, this is really important. If you got your federal student loans before the summer of 2010, any of your federal loans before the summer of 2010, then they might have come from an older program called FEL, F-F-E-L, it's Federal Family Education Loan. 
This was that parallel government loan program where the banks and private lenders like Sally May, Access Group, Citibank, and all those folks would issue the Stafford loans and the Grad Plus loans on behalf of the federal government. It's fine, lots of us had them. They were more common than not, and you may still have them. Um, but if you do, you have to take an extra step before they're eligible for forgiveness you must convert those fell loans into direct loans, and you do that by consolidating. Otherwise, you can't make payments that count towards forgiveness, because fell loans are not eligible for public service loan forgiveness. And that's because we don't owe them to the federal government. We owe them to banks, and the federal government doesn't want to write checks to banks. Well, uh, actually, no. <laughs> they don't want to write small checks to banks. <laughs> um, yes. So the question is whether he can do this right now while he's in law school. No, you can't, but you don't need to. Are you working full-time in public service while you're in school? Okay, so if you were, then that would be somewhat more disappointing. But if you're not, then um, after you graduate is, is soon enough. Um, and you used to be allowed to consolidate when you're in school, but you can't anymore. Okay, yes? You said you take the step, you have to convert So let me tell you some more about that. So if you have those older fell loans, you have to consolidate them is how you convert them into federal direct loans. And I'll show you sort of um, how that works. Um, I also want to tell you some more about the interest rates that I've introduced when we talk about consolidation. Okay, because they go hand in hand and a lot of people are wanting to get better interest rates on their student loans, right? I know you guys want better interest rates on your student loans. I, I don't have better interest rates for your student loans. So I'm not gonna give them to you, um, but I will tell you what the deal is with them and about consolidation. Um, federal consolidation loans, the ones that, that we're talking about, um, have fixed interest rates, so they're not gonna change over time. But the way they establish the interest rate is by looking at the loans that you're consolidating. So it, it really is like um, refinancing your student loans. So they take a look at your loans, and many of you have loans at 6.8% and at 7.9%, and then they sort of combine the interest rates and they give you an interest rate that is the weighted average of the underlying loans. Essentially, it preserves the interest costs where they were. It, does, it means you're not really any better off and you're not really any worse off, except that you don't have the flexibility you had before of like paying the more expensive ones first, the ones with the, um, with the higher interest rate. Um, but you're also not going to improve your lot much by, um, by consolidating in terms of interest rates. Um, if you have really old loans, like some of us, you might have loans at a variable interest rate, um, in wh which, is, which is a whole other story and which is a whole other reason to consolidate. Um, but you guys have been borrowing at fixed interest rates for quite a while. It's been that way since 2006. Um, just very recently, um, Congress did what they did about um, interest rates. And so how many of you are still in school? Oh, a lot of you, okay. So, so you guys are a lucky group of individuals who is benefiting from the um, legislation that passed this summer. Um, it's, it's, in my opinion, of course, I have strong opinions about these things. Um, I think it's basically a you know, stupid law that is going to be short-term good for y'all, and I'm glad for you, like I really am, but long-term bad for everybody else, so unless they change it. But you guys are the ones who get the benefits, so hey, right on, you know? So you're borrowing at lower rates right now. In fact, your loans are at 5.41 um, on your unsubsidized loans and at 6.41 on your Grad Plus loans. Okay, but what's gonna happen is you guys are gonna have different interest rates every year from here on out, at least that's the plan. Um, but, what, but, but what I want you to take away from this is that consolidating isn't gonna really do anything about that one way or another, unless you've got those variable rate ones from way back in the day. Um, <clears throat> but, what, uh, but what consolidating does do is it converts fell loans into federal direct loans. It just basically refinances them with the new lender who is the federal government. Okay, yeah, um, questions? Yes. Uh, 
So the question is whether all federal loans are either direct or felt. Um, not quite all, but almost all. So all Stafford loans and all Grad Plus loans and all consolidation loans are, and all Parent Plus loans are either direct or felt. Perkins loans are federal loans, but they're campus-based loans. So they're essentially neither direct nor felt. Um, but in general, you, you know, pretty much yes. Yeah. So if you go to that National Student Loan Data System, sometimes right on your summary page it'll say fell whatever, or it'll say direct Stafford. Sometimes it says nothing but like Stafford. So you're like, is that fell or is it direct? It's probably direct if it doesn't if it doesn't say fell. But what you should do is look at the detail of the loan, and check to be sure that the U.S. Department of Education is the lender because the Department of Education is the lender on all of the direct loans. And if it's anybody else, um, then it's a FELL loan. And you, you only find federal loans on the um, NSLDS, National Student Loan Data System. Okay. All right, so there's lots and lots of repayment plans available to you. You graduate, you've got a grace period, before you have to start making payments. It's like six months for most loans, could be nine months for Perkins loans, and then you, they want you to start making payments. Uh, but unlike if you get like a car loan or, or a mortgage, it isn't, it isn't established for sure what the repayment plan will be. You get to choose from a, a lot more options than you should be choosing from. Because most of these options are old and yucky, and you don't want them. Like income sensitive, for example, has no reason to live. Alternative doesn't really even exist. Um, there's something called income contingent, it's just there to confuse you. Um, but all these will be on the form. That's why you know, we really do need to talk about it. Um, and, and most people will tell you that, like your loan servicers and other people will say, will present all your options to you for you to decide between. And, and I will too, but, but I, also think that you should know that um, you're likely to be better off thinking about these income-driven options, um, but also recognizing that if you can afford to pay more quickly, you should do that. Um, and you can do that no matter which repayment plan you choose. Um, okay, so, um, so whether or not to, um, to consolidate has to do with which uh, repayment options you have available to you, and which forgiveness provisions you have available to you, and only rarely what your interest rates are. Um, so good reasons to consolidate your loans include that you have old variable rate loans, which is probably not the case for most of you, um, or you have those FELL loans from pre-2010 and you wanna get them into public service loan forgiveness. You wanna get them forgiven. That's a super good reason to consolidate. That's probably the best reason to consolidate lately. Um, the other reason to consolidate is that only the federal direct loans are eligible for the newest, bestest income-driven plan called pay as you earn, um, which is available not to all of us anyway, but for those of you to whom it's available, it's only in the federal direct program. Okay, so um, those are the best reasons to consolidate if you have any of those circumstances and you have those older fell loans. Um, other reasons people used to do it is to get these longer repayment terms, to get all their loans with one lender. Okay, whatever, that's still true, but they're ju it's just not important to you because of the other provisions. Um, if you have Perkins loans, you could, ca you could consolidate them. I know hardly any of you have them. Um, they have their own cancellation provisions that are mainly for teachers and military folks and um, don't usually apply to lawyers. Um, and those provisions are lost upon cancellation. Um, if you've been making payments for a long, uh, for a long time on those older fell loans, uh, you could have earned an interest rate reduction that you could lose by consolidating. Um, so those things are bad, right? So there are pros and cons that you should think through for yourself in particular. Um, but in general, you know, consolidating is something you should do if you have those older fell loans and you, want to, and you want them to be forgiven for public service loan forgiveness. Otherwise, it may not be a big issue for you. You hear a lot more about consolidation than, than um, what would really make sense in light of the sort of relative and important, unimportance of it these days. Questions about consolidation? So 
the question is, is that whether it's extremely difficult or how long it takes. Um, it, it often goes fairly well and it sometimes doesn't go as well. It depends on how many loans you have with how many lenders. Um, but in general, it's, a, it's an online application. You list your loans. Those lenders have to de deliver information to Federal Direct with whom you're consolidating. It takes about 30, 60 days. It's going a lot more smoothly lately. Um, but it is something you should tr follow pretty closely just to make sure it's going right. Um, but it, it, in general, whether it's smooth, you know, it kind of depends on if you have a complicated loan portfolio usually. But it's not hard for you in any event. It's just sort of more whether you just have to kind of track whether it gets messed up. Yeah. Yeah, so his question is whether you can consolidate some but not all. Yes, you can consolidate some but not all, and you might want to um, because you could uh, group some, you know, you could preserve your ability to repay higher interest loans first, for example, if you did something like that fancy. That, again, is the sort of thing where it's, it's so clever that it's, the system doesn't really deal with it as well. So I would just say, you know, you, what is bizarre is that you must list every loan you have on your consolidation application, whether or not you are applying to consolidate them. And then you have to tell them which loans you're planning to consolidate. So it does provide the opportunity for a mistake to occur. Um, but yes, you do. Ha that is something you can do. Um, and I wanted to mention to to the to the was it, were, you had been making payments on your loans before you went back to school, right? So the other thing I wanted to mention, just in case that's the case, is that if you had started making payments that counted towards forgiveness, you would not want to consolidate your loans after you did that because you would be paying off those loans and then getting a new loan and there wouldn't be any payments made that counted towards forgiveness on the new loan, okay? But for most of you, I'm saying consolidate these loans that don't qualify for forgiveness anyway, so it's not an issue. Um, but it, it can be for some people. Um, this is a new website that I encourage you to visit. It's called studentloans.gov. You sign in using your four-digit federal PIN not that new, but it's pretty new. Um, and you can, you can apply for the income-driven repayment options there, but you can also uh, use a pretty cool new tool where you can estimate what your payments would be under the different plans and that kind of thing. Um, so I recommend that. Um, so yeah, so the, those of you who might want to be considering the income-driven plans are um, anyone who's not earning as much as they would like as compared to how much they owe. Um, everybody who borrowed a ton of money for school, um, because these are the people who could get this forgiveness at the end of the day, whether it be public service or income-driven forgiveness. And certainly if you're working full-time in a public service position, you should be thinking about um, choosing an income-driven plan, because they're the only ones that qualify uh, towards public service loan forgiveness. Um, and the, the two best ones are income-based repayment and pay-as-you-earn. Income contingent repayment is also available and, and can be advantageous to um, a very you know, small minority of people in very unusual circumstances. Um, but most of you want to think about whether you can get pay-as-you-earn and if you can, be happy. And if you can't, be happy that you've got income-based repayment, which is way fabulous on its own, just not quite as fabulous as pay-as-you-earn. Um, the best thing about income-based repayment is that it's widely available. All of you can get it, um, but not all of you maybe can get pay as you earn. To get either of these options, you have to demonstrate what's called a partial financial hardship. So this is where that salary stuff comes in. You have to, you have, to have a, a somewhat dramatic debt-to-income ratio, which is really quite simple for most law grads to show. So, you know, I mean, people that have graduate and professional degrees have expensive educations, and when you first graduate, you know, you typically have a pretty substantial student loan burden. But, you know, if you're a typical undergraduate, you owe 25 grand. If you get a job making, you know, $60,000 and you only owe 25 grand, these, are, these options are not even going to be available to you, but you also won't need them. Um, and so um, that's uh, to be recognized. And now I'm finally getting to your question about what counts as income. Um, the, the income determination is really important to your payment amount. 
uh, and they base it on adjusted gross income, but it's the adjusted gross income that is reported on your federal tax return. So if you're married, you have to think really carefully about how you file your taxes. Because if you file a joint return with your spouse, then your spouse's income will affect your student loan payment, and yours will affect his or hers. So married people have complicated decisions to make. And this includes um, same-sex married couples now for the, for the first year, because um, those couples have a new right to file a joint federal tax return. Um, but they might not want to take advantage of that new right to file a joint federal tax return because it might result in higher student loan payments and less student loan forgiveness. Okay, so some married people are going to be better off paying more in taxes so they can pay less in student loans. So don't assume that, because like I'm married, I file jointly, most married people do. We get benefits by doing that. We pay less in tax and that's, we like that, you know. Um, but it's not necessarily cheaper to pay less tax. You might want to pay more tax and less in student loans. So tricky, tricky decision. And then you guys, if you're going to stay in California, you guys have that whole community property weirdness going on here. So that makes it even more complicated. So if you file a separate federal tax return, so you're married, but you file separately at the federal level, and you live in California, where it's a community property state, you don't get to just put the income you earned from work, you have to put half of your marital income, right? So like, if, you know, that, that is not necessarily as, as good as, it depends. If you make more than your spouse, it helps you. If you make less than your spouse, it hurts you. Um, but you, you can get around this by filling out extra paperwork with the Department of Education. So how many people here are married? Am I even just talking to anybody? I see a few married people. Anybody engaged to be married? Huh? All right, somebody hold him down and I'll talk him off the ledge, right? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, so married people need to think really carefully about their tax filing decisions and how it relates to their student loans. Um, does anybody who's married have spouses who also have student loans? Yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. So um, interestingly, your choice really is filed jointly. They look at all your income together, and they look at your total cumulative marital student loan debt, and they establish your payments based on that. Or you file separately, and they just treat you separately, and they look at your income separately and your loans separately. Those are your choices, and you have to sort of figure out what's better. Um, your payments are also based on your family size, but they don't look at your uh, tax return to determine your family size. So your family size is the same whether you file jointly or separately. You count yourself, you count your spouse, you count your children that you support, um, whether they live with you or not, and you count other people who live in your household and who are dependent on you for their income in your family size, okay? So the more kids you have, less you pay in your student loans. Um, okay, so joint or separate tax filing status. Questions about that? No, those will come up later when you're talking with your spouses. And I mentioned you, you will want to consider, uh, when, you're, when you're working, you will want to consider um, whether you might want to uh, establish your income differently than your tax form. Yes. Yeah, so his question is when, when do we have to decide this and can we change our mind here and there? So um, the answer is yes, you have to decide at the beginning and yes, you can change your mind and do trial and error later. And so wh what I mean by that is that you should consider that last tax filing of your third year or your graduating year is likely to be the tax form that they look at for your first year of repayment. So you might want to um, dis make a decision for that first year but then you can change it later. Um, you can always choose every year how you file your taxes. And you can evaluate how that will affect your loans because you do have to certify, recertify your income every single year. 
So, um, all right, so let me tell you who qualifies for this fabulous pay as you earn and who doesn't. Um, both of these repayment plans are good. Both of them have low monthly payments based on income. Um, I'll tell you what this slide says. If it's hard to read, don't worry. Um, pay as you earn has payments that are only 10% of a figure called discretionary income, whereas income-based repayment, it's 15%. Both qualify for public service loan forgiveness, but pay as you earn has a 20-year um, cancellation provision um, rather than the 25-year for people who don't earn uh, public service loan forgiveness. So pay as you earn is, is better if you can get it, um, but it's only available for, for quote unquote new borrowers. Um, and new borrowers are people who didn't owe money on a federal student loan on October 1st of 2007. So if you started borrowing before that and hadn't fully repaid it on that date, then you don't get it no matter what you do now. It's just you don't. Um, and, uh, but if you didn't owe money on that day, then you also have to have gotten a federal student loan sometime on or after October 1st of 2011. So that's true for the current students, you're getting those right now. Um, but if you graduated a while ago, like if you graduated in the spring of 2011, you might not have borrowed anything on or after October 1st of 2011. But a consolidation loan would count towards that second prong. So you could do something about that second part. Yes? So you said you have to borrow all the time that you didn't know that you had to borrow from the federal government. But that would still be the same thing. Okay, so, um, so, let, so on October 1st of 2007, you didn't know anything. Yeah, so it's any time after. So any time after. So you're borrowing now, you've done it, you did it your last year, you did it your first year. So if you started school in 2011, then your, your, your first loans that first semester probably were dispersed in August or September, not, um, not October, so they wouldn't have counted, but the ones you got the second semester would have and the ones beyond that would have, and you only needed to be one. So, and this is, oh, and this, I, I understand now the confusion, so this is important. So this is not to determine which loans you can get pay as you earn for, it's to determine which of us as human individuals can get this plan, which is confusing. So they're looking at you, not your loans, to say, did you owe money to us, the federal government, on this date or that date? And if you did, like you had one tiny little loan for 10 bucks, that you got in 2006, then psh, sorry. Um, yes? Yeah, so unfortunately, so his question is whether if that includes his undergrad loans, it includes any federal loan you had. Um, unless, and this is the sort of one thing, like if you borrowed like in 1988 and repaid it in 2006, and by 2007 you didn't have any balance, that is sort of the one way around it. Yes? So why is there the kind of fake federal loans? The Perkins loans? Well, the, I mean, the SIP. Oh, the FELL loans. All my loans are due in high grade originally. Yeah, those still count. Unfortunately. Yes, unfortunately. Sorry. And I'll explain to you why, because you might, as lo to me, it, it helps me to understand it. It is arbitrary, like to begin with. Like, it is arbitrary. And the reason they came up with these dates is that. Um, Income-based repayment existed, and it was good. It was good enough, and people were happy with it. Um, President Obama was on the campaign trail during um, 2011, right? That was when he was campaigning, um, and and said at the University of Iowa to the gathered students, "I'm going to make your loan payments more affordable. I'm going to reduce your your loan payments," um, and everybody's like, "Yeah!" And then he went back to Washington, and the Department of Education was like, "We don't have any money." and you're not the legislative branch, so how are we gonna do that? So they figured out, okay, well, we can, we can use our regulatory authority to extend these benefits to these people, but we need to narrow who it goes to because we can't pay for it, and so we need to, we need to make it true what he said, that those people in that room are getting the benefit and nobody else is, basically. And it's true, because they were people who were in school at that time, um, current students, yes. Yeah. 
Yes, it, it, yeah, so unfortunately, and there's always people, so I mean, and I, I, feel, I feel you, brother, I really, really do. Like, I do, because, you know, I mean, there's people like me who, like, literally started borrowing in, like, no kidding, 1988. So I'm like, okay, I'm used to not getting the new good stuff. But listen, this is another thing that comes back to our conversation about can you count on public service loan forgiveness and the good stuff lasting? You probably can, because whenever they come up with changes, the good stuff they don't give to us. They only give to future borrowers, usually. Sometimes they go back a little bit if you're lucky. But when they make things less generous, they, all, they don't do it to people who already have loans. They do it prospectively. Usually the rules that applied when you borrowed are the rules that apply to you. So when you got those loans, you, didn't, you weren't relying on this program. It didn't even exist, you know? I mean, although, I mean, it would be nice. I, I agree for sure for you to have it. And actually the president is trying to expand it. So call your uh, congressman. Um, all right, so I want to talk to you about a couple of paperwork things and take your final questions. Um, I want to show you something on this form, although you really can't see it on the TVs. Um, if, you're, if you're choosing an income-driven option, I want to encourage you to figure out for yourself whether you qualify for pay as you earn, okay, by looking at those dates. Because if you click the box that says, hey, tell me if I'm eligible for this, um, they're not going to flag for you if you have those older federal loans that are not eligible. And those older FEL loans can be consolidated into direct in order to become eligible for pay as you earn. Um, and they won't tell you that. So you need to be on top of that yourselves. Um, so both of those um, are good reasons to consolidate public service loan forgiveness and pay as you earn for those older FEL loans, okay? So little recap, and then we'll talk about the paperwork for a moment. Um, federal direct loans are the only loans eligible for public service loan forgiveness. Okay, the biggest reason that people are not earning public service loan forgiveness who could is because they have not consolidated older FEL loans. I got this yesterday again confirmed directly by the Department of Education. Right, don't let this be you. Okay, if you have those older loans, you've got to do something about it. If you have private loans, you can't do anything about it. Um, your payments have to be on time to count towards forgiveness, um, and you can't get credit for more than one payment per month. You can make more than one payment, but it's not going to count towards forgiveness. They'll take your money, but they won't count towards forgiveness. And the paperwork is going to be a bear, but it's really important and worth it to you to get on top of it. So um, I want to let you know that there's going to be an application for forgiveness. After you've made all the qualifying payments, you're still going to have to apply. But that application hasn't even been drafted yet. So I can't even tell you anything about it. I'll be trying to work with them to make it less horrible than it might otherwise be. But you need to keep your ear to the ground for like, it's not going to be automatic. There's nothing automatic about any of this. Um, so don't wait for it. Um, and every year you're in these income-driven plans, you've got to recertify and verify your income and your family size every single year on time or they will like capitalize your unpaid interest and kick you out of IBR, like seriously. And you will be, you will, you will weep like babies. <laughs> you will weep, so don't let that be you. Like, because I'm not a naturally organized person, right? And I don't read all the, my, all the email that I get who does, right? You have to read the stuff you get from your lender about this stuff because it, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars of your money on the line. So if you're not naturally organized, get somebody who is to help you with it. Um, you have the opportunity to certify that your employment counts towards forgiveness. There's a form you can use to do that and you should do it every year because that's the smart move um, and you should, uh, you should be sure to apply for forgiveness. And then the final last little sort of um, trick they throw at you is that not only do you have to do public service when you make those payments, each of the 120 payments, but you have to be in a public service job when you apply, when you fill out and sign the application, and when they grant the forgiveness. So you've got to stick solid in that public service job until you get the letter from them saying, okay, you're good, your loans are forgiven. Um, because you could, you could do everything else and, uh, and, and lose it at the last minute 
not lose it, you just have to go get another public service job and then apply again. But um, that is one of those silly little sort of traps they throw in there. Um, anybody here getting John R. Justice benefits? No, anybody? No, okay, I don't think, I didn't think you would be. All right, well, I'm happy to take whatever, uh, whatever other questions you have. Yes? So he's asking about the on-time payments. Um, you don't lose everything, you just don't get credit for that payment. It has to be received within 15 days of the due date to be a qualifying payment. So if you miss a payment, then you miss getting credit for that payment even if you pay it a little later. Um, so it's not the end of the world, um, but it, it's, you know, it, it is one of those things like, oh hey, it's late, you don't get credit for it. And you certainly wouldn't want to do, have that be a repeating pattern, or it would it would it could really hurt you. So discretionary income, in a nutshell, is um, it's the amount by which your adjusted gross income exceeds 150 percent of the federal poverty level for your family size. <laughs> so. That's why I didn't put a chart up there about that, you know. But what it, but but it's it's a it's a particular term of art that they come to. So and it's it's a low number, you know. So I mean, they take your they take your income, and they they make these adjustments based on the size of your family is really the only thing that uh, that affects it and the federal poverty rate, but which is which is low. So what it basically does is it preserves a certain core of income that you have. They say, okay. You have a wife and a child, so the three of you, your, your poverty rate is this tiny amount of whatever it is, you know, $15,000 or whatever. And they say, we're not going to touch that. You don't even have to pretend like that's available for your student loans. We're going to make you pay 10% of what's left, is essentially what they do. Yes? So, so our question is about the taxability of some of the forgiveness benefits. So yeah, so there is a potential for some very significant tax bills for some borrowers, not for people who get public service loan forgiveness, but for people who get the longer term forgiveness that isn't tied to employment. Um, like for example, tomorrow I'm going to talk to the veterinarians at Davis. Veterinarians are, are loaded with debt just like us. They owe more than we do, and you don't make a lot of money being a vet, and they're way oversaturated. So many, many, many of those students will diligently make payments on their loans for 25 years and will still have a substantial outstanding balance, which will be canceled by the government. It can be $100,000 for some people easily, 150, because of the interest that's been adding up over the 25 years and that will be considered taxable income in the year in which it is received. So they will essentially get a 1099 in the mail that says, hey, you got whatever the amount is, $60,000 worth of extra income this year, pay tax on it. So it can be handled if it's, if it's planned for, um, and we're, there are efforts to try to get the law changed, but um, you know, that also, again, requires Congress, so that's, a, that's tricky. Yes? Okay. Yep. Yeah. That's exactly right. So his. Yeah. So his. So his. Yeah. So his question is: So he's still in his grace period, having gotten out of school. So you're right. You could send money, and they would take it, but it would not count as a payment towards public service loan so forgiveness. Yeah, well, you're close anyway, probably. So the only other choice you have, and at this point I'm not saying it's a good idea for you or if it necessarily ever is, you can, you can stop your grace period and trigger repayment by consolidating, even if all your loans are already indirect. That, but it, yeah, exactly, exactly. 
I would, if, if I was in your shoes and I was, and I was gonna be entering repayment in 30 or 60 days anyway, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it now because you could keep that money that you would be spending on your payments anyway, you know, rather than pay, starting to make your payments. But you're right, if you, if you had immediately gotten to work, immediately gotten consolidated and immediately started making payments under IBR or whatever, you could have had a couple under your belt already. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so she's asking about when you choose your repayment plan and whether you can switch. You haven't chosen one yet, and you won't until after you finish your grace period after graduation. So you graduate, you have six months before you have to decide. If you don't pick one then, they just thrust one upon you, the ones that are expensive. Surprise, surprise. So, but you don't have to choose yet, and even when you do choose, you're not stuck. You can change your repayment plan whenever you want, to whichever one you want that you're eligible to choose. But there might be some consequences to doing that. So like if you're in income-based repayment for a while, you could have been making payments less than the interest. You could have had interest add up that you didn't pay. So then if you choose to leave income-based repayment, you could if you wanted to, but that unpaid interest would be added to the principal of the loan or capitalized. That would be expensive. You might not want to do that. Um, and they also make you go through the expensive standard repayment plan for one month before they let you go into another one after that. And there's rules that they can like, you know, not actually accept the payment. It's very weird, but, but you can switch, but sometimes there's complications associated with it. Yes? Yeah, so her question is, should I pay the interest as I go along, if I can afford to, and just to keep it down, and what are the uh, effects on this program? There's no reason for you not to do that. It's a good strategy to keep your interest from adding up. Um, and certainly, if you know that you're going to be fully responsible for all of your loans, you wanna do everything you can to minimize the cost. And that's a really great way to minimize the cost, is to keep up with the interest. So it, because the interest that's adding up while you're in school is gonna get capitalized right at the end of your grace period. That's gonna get tacked on, you know, like it's probably at least several grand that gets added on and then starts, you know, churning up interest. Um, but, you know, if you knew that, that, you were, the, that you were gonna do public service for 10 years and, you know, that you would, or that you would, or if you owe so much that you don't think you'll ever get it paid off, then maybe you wouldn't, so I guess I would say you might consider what your total financial circumstances are. If you have more expensive debt like a private student loan or if you have credit card debt or if you have a, maybe even a mortgage or if you don't have an emergency fund of a couple thousand dollars of cash, I wouldn't necessarily send every single dime you have to your student loans. I think there's a lot of things you should think about. Yes. Yeah, sure. Um, so she's asking about the employer certification. Um, there's a, there are forms. They're on my website. Um, they're on the Department of Education website. They're a little harder to find. Um, my website is askheatherjarvis.com. They're on the tools page towards the bottom. Um, it's a form that you download, and you, f you just fill out some basic information. You take it to your employer, and they sign off and say, oh, yeah, she works here. She works full time, and we're a 501c3. Yeah. Yes, you can do it either way. So they didn't even get that form out until like January of 2011 or 2012, I even forget now. Um, and you, so yeah, so you might have to go back to previous employers or you might have to do it if you're still at the same job for a, for a period behind, yeah. And, that, and then typically you, you would wanna get into a pattern of doing it every year um, because you can't do it more often than that. But that would be the, that'd be the smart thing to do. Yeah. Um, it's the federal poverty line. And it changes every year by around 3%. I'll stick around as long as you guys want and answer questions. If anybody wants to stay, and I certainly understand a lot of you have other things to do in class and everything, so yeah.
Right. Yeah. I think it's a great question. Um, so he's asking, you know, how do you really decide what is the best, you know, strategy for yourself, or how to evaluate your options in terms of whether you're maximizing forgiveness or, or um, you know, paying as aggressively as you can to minimize the cost. Um, I am happy to answer it directly. You know, I I don't I I think that this is an important program that was that was passed with um, uh, deliberation and for an excellent reason. Um, and I think there's nothing wrong with, with you benefiting from the program. I think that's exactly what it's meant for, so that you can have the, a full life in spite of your choice to do public service and, you know, and your expensive education. So I don't think there's anything wrong with you benefiting from the program. Um, I also think that you have to evaluate your own sort of um, career goals and sort of risk tolerance or whatever they call it, you know, so um, I, I don't think you should do anything that um, maximizes your debt. Like I would never tell a student to borrow more than they need just because they think it's gonna be forgiven. I think that would be stupid. You know, you don't know what, what life will bring. Um, but I do think that when you're making the decision, you should think about things like, um, is my whole financial house in order? You know, do I have some cash saved? Do I have the right insurance that I need to protect myself and my family? Um, do I, um, am I you know, saving for a house if I want one? Because for example, a mortgage, you, if you don't have a whole good down payment, you have to pay purchase mortgage insurance, right? That's, a, that's money you pay every month, doesn't go to your equity, doesn't go to your loans, doesn't go to anybody, just goes to the bank, right? Does no good for anyone except the property owners um, and the banks. And so I, I think there are, are things that are worth doing with your money in addition to paying your loans aggressively. Um, I, don't, I don't think that you should um, uh, you know, be living luxuriously necessarily, but, but I think if you're committed to public service, if you really like it, if it's what you've always wanted to do, if you can't see yourself doing anything else, um, uh, that you know you sh that you should absolutely do what you can to, to get those benefits and do other smart things with your with your money so that you can prepare in case things do change and in case things don't go the way you think they will I mean what if you um, can't stay in those jobs or you know something changes or you get sick or whatever else you know I think you should you should reevaluate often um, and, and and you're not going to find I guess what the best thing I feel like I can say to you is that you're not, there is no perfect answer. Like you're not gonna find that source that says, okay, do these steps and then you'll know what the right thing to do is. There is no right thing for you to do. All you can do is something that is reasonable based on what you currently know. And that is not everything you would wanna know in order to be able to make the best choice. Um, so do something that makes sense for now and then keep your eye on it and adjust as you go and, and then you should, be, you should be in good shape. That's the way I think about it. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe I didn't understand what you were saying earlier about not repeating. About the uh, pay, pay as you earn, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Can you go over that whole 20 Harvey thing? That yeah. I'm not understanding that explanation. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, I signed my first promissory note in July of 2012. I know someone else asked the same question. So, you're good. You're good, but I can, let me, But I will be happy to explain it better. And I've I've been trying to. Well, it's, it's not an easy thing to explain. It's right? not. It is a very weird thing. So there are these two dates. One of them is October first of two thousand seven, and one of them is October first of twenty eleven. And it is not the period in between those two dates that matters. We don't care at all about what happens between two thousand seven and twenty eleven at all. What we care about is, is the, the day, October 1st, 2007. So what each person should do is cast their mind back to that date, right? Get in your DeLorean, is that what it is, right? And go to October 1st of 2007 and look at your federal student loan balance. And if it's zero, you just told me it was, then you meet the first requirement of that program. You, you meet that requirement if you had a zero balance on a federal loan. If you owed, if you had, if you owed anything on a federal loan, then you're out of luck. Period. End of story. You don't get it. Okay, but you didn't. And then 
you then you look at, so you've met that part. Then you look at the second part, October 1st of 2011. You say, did I borrow any federal student loans at all, either on that date or any time after, which includes all the time that has passed since then and will ever pass in the future? Which obviously you have, and you still are. So you meet it. It's that, that, it's that simple. It's not that, that simple. You should, qual you should be able to choose pay as you earn for all of your federal student loans. Okay. So the only things you would then have to check on, which I know since you just told me you started borrowing in 2011, you don't have those older fell loans, so that's no, fine. Some just, people no. might, but you don't. I, so, I yeah, so you've got all federal direct loans, so those loans are eligible for pay as, as you earn because they're federal direct. You're eligible for pay as you earn because of when you started borrowing and when right. you continued borrowing. Um, so the only other thing you have to look at is your debt to income ratio. You have to have that partial financial hardship, um, which if you owe at least as much or around the amount that you earn in a year, then you almost certainly qualify for it. And in fact, you, you, could, you could earn a lot more than what you owe and still qualify. You can do that in pay as you earn. Okay. Yeah, and it's confusing because pay as you earn and income based repayment are for everybody who needs reduced payments because of their income, not just people in public service. So, so there's, there's no employment requirement associated with those repayment options. You want to be thinking about those what, if you're not working, especially, right? Or if you're working in public service and not making a lot of money. But if you want public service loan forgiveness, a necessary condition of earning it is making payments under one of those plans. Okay. okay? So you can. That's absolutely. So you have to be. If you want to be under one of these plans, you have to be a full time. No. Oh, okay. So you can you can choose an income driven repayment plan, whether you're working for public service or whether you're working for you know, for your dad or whether you're unemployed or whether you're you're working. It doesn't matter. Exactly. Okay. So really what happens is when you choose one of these repayment plans, you don't know how long you're going to be making payments or whether you're going to be getting forgiveness. You might make payments for 10 years while you're working in public service and then get, your, and again, get the rest canceled. Or you might make payments and keep making payments and not be in public service and not get cancellation and, and repay your loans yourself you know, based on your income after 15 years. So Yes, if you, exactly, you got it. Yeah, you're welcome, yeah. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. You got it. The payments don't have to be consecutive. You don't have to do 10 straight years or 10 full years with one employer. You can go in and out. It's all good. Go ahead. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's exactly right. You can always pay more than what's due. There's no penalty. There's no prepayment penalties. There's no, there's, they're not going to be like, oh, you're making more money than we thought. Well, you have to pay more next month or whatever. You can pay more, and it can be a good strategy, um, but you don't have to. So that's one of the reasons I like these plans is that it, 
you've got the choice of paying less if your car breaks down or if you break your leg or what you know whatever it is. And there are even other options for reducing or postponing your payments in those cases. But yeah, you got it. That's right. It gives you a lot of flexibility in deciding what is best for your cash flow at that time. That's, you know, what I'm thinking. So, yeah. I know, it's so weird. Right. It doesn't disqualify you. So, so the only thing that can by itself disqualify you from pay as you earn is if you owed money on October 1st of 2007. So if you, if you started borrowing any time after that, you're not automatically disqualified. Okay, so, the, but what, what some people might have done is they started borrowing on October 2nd, 2007, and then they borrowed, 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 and then they graduated in the spring of 2011, and they didn't get another loan. Then they're they still need to, they still need to worry about meeting that second prong. But that's not you, so you're fine. And it's weird because it's that whole period between 2007 and 2011, nobody cares what you did with your loans at all. It doesn't make a bit of difference whether you borrowed or didn't borrow every year or none of the years. Nobody cares. It's just, did you owe anything on that first date? No. Okay then did you borrow something any time on or any time after that other date, regardless of what you did in between? Okay. It makes as much sense as it can make with it being the rule, which is, it's, which is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, uh, complicated, yeah. Um, let me ask you this, are you in school full time or more than half time? So your loans are in deferment? Okay, so this is a complicated situation and maybe Joe and I can talk this one through a little bit because I haven't been able to figure this one out. So you're, you, you can't get credit for payments you make right now because your loans are in a deferment status, um, but um, that deferment that you have, the in-school deferment, applies because you're in school more than half time. I believe, and I don't see any reason in the law to think otherwise, that that should be optional to you, whether you take advantage of that deferment or not. It used to be back in the day when I was in school, we had to beg them to every semester to defer our loans. We would have to send stuff that said, I'm still in school, don't make me pay, right? And later, guys. And, um, but now it's an automated process. So even if you were able to say to them, you know, hey, I want to be making payments, you couldn't effectively do it for any period of time that would last because they would get the ping again, oh, she's still in school, and they would put her back into deferment. And there's another sort of issue that may or may not apply to you, which is that the loans you're borrowing right now and that you maybe you got last year and whatever, you haven't exhausted the grace period on those loans. So you can't actually do anything to kick those loans into a repayment status. But some people, and I don't know if this is the case for you or not, would have had loans in the past, got graduated, say, from undergraduate school, had the grace period run, started making payments on their loans, then go back to law school, get those loans deferred, work in full-time in public service, want to make payments that count towards forgiveness. You should be able to do it. There's no reason why you can't, but, but procedurally, I can't imagine how you would make it happen. Would, 